As Russia threatens to use a nuclear bomb in Ukraine, many people globally are scared because of the immense destruction nuclear bombs are capable of. However, a warning about an immeasurably bigger explosion has been going out since, and the warning is coming from no other person than the chief of NASA. The master scientist has been warning about the terrifying explosion of a star known as Betelgeuse. When will Betelgeuse finally explode? Why is Betelgeuse's explosion dangerous? Is planet Earth safe from the effects of Betelgeuse's explosion? In this video, we dive into the NASA chief's terrifying warning about the Betelgeuse explosion. Nearly 80 years ago, two events occurred that have become the poster picture of atomic warfare. The US detonated an atomic uranium bomb over Hiroshima, Japan. The bomb, codenamed Little Boy, killed an estimated 70,000 people and injured tens of thousands of citizens more. Days later, another bomb dropped on Nagasaki, codenamed Fat Man. It wiped out about 40,000 people more and severely injured thousands more. While some people died as a direct result of the explosion, numerous other people succumbed to the effects of radiation. Those two times were the only times in history that human-made nuclear explosions occurred. Little Boy was a 15 kiloton bomb, while Fat Man was 20 kiloton. However, far from it, the bombings at Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not the only nuclear explosion to have occurred. Every second, billions upon billions of stars, including the Sun, produce immense heat and light from powerful nuclear explosions. One of these stars, Betelgeuse, is nearing its death, and the demise will be accompanied by one of the most powerful explosions ever witnessed in the universe. But what is Betelgeuse exactly? When you talk about powerful stars, you can't fail to mention Betelgeuse. It is a red supergiant star so large that it's one of the largest stars we can see with our unaided eyes. Betelgeuse is called Alpha Orionis in the Bayer designation. Scientists give the Alpha title to the brightest star in the constellation, but in actual fact, Betelgeuse is only the second brightest in Orion after the star named Rigel. However, because of its variability, Betelgeuse sometimes outshines Rigel. This must be what happened when Johann Bayer published the Uranima Tria in 1603, where Betelgeuse became known as Alpha Orionis and Rigel as Beta Orionis. Betelgeuse is a variable star with an apparent brightness that varies from 0 to plus 1.6. As such, this supergiant is the second brightest star in Orion and the tenth brightest star in the night sky on any given day. Betelgeuse is a single star and does not belong to any star system. Also, it is considered a runaway star since it's not part of any star-forming region. Interestingly, Betelgeuse is only 10 million years old, quite young in terms of star ages. In comparison, the Sun is about 5 billion years old, but Betelgeuse is an evolved star despite its age. It consumes fuel faster than the Sun because stars that massive require lots of fuel to keep going. But what it lacks in age, Betelgeuse makes up in girth. The massive star is approximately 1,000 times larger than our Sun. At this dimension, if you could put Betelgeuse where the Sun is, it will reach past the asteroid belt and even beyond Jupiter. This means that it would engulf all the terrestrial planets – Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Despite being vastly larger than the Sun, Betelgeuse is only 16.5 times as massive as the Sun. It has 126,000 solar luminosities, making it look bright at 548 light-years away. This star has a surface temperature of 3600 Kelvin, which means it's cooler than the Sun. There is an interesting story behind Betelgeuse's name. You see, many stars with unique names got them from translations of foreign names and sometimes were mistranslated. This was what happened to Betelgeuse. In Arabic, the constellation of Orion was called Jauza or Jauzar. From this, Betelgeuse was called Yad al Jauzar, which means the Hand of al Jauzar. During the 13th century, the Yar in the Arabic name became Bar, and this era caught on. And from that, the European name Betelgeuse was born. Betelgeuse is not difficult to spot in the sky. In fact, Betelgeuse is useful for locating other stars. Since Orion is one of the easiest constellations to spot, many use it as a navigational aid to find other objects in the night sky. For example, if you draw a line through the three stars of Orion's belt and extend it upwards, you will end up in Aldebaran, the brightest star in the Taurus constellation. From there, you can migrate to the Pleiades. And this is the same way you can follow Betelgeuse as a guide to finding other stars. By connecting Rigel and Betelgeuse and extending it past the red supergiant, we will arrive at Castor and Pollux, the two brightest stars in the constellation of Gemini. Another reason you will easily locate Betelgeuse is its unmistakable bright red color. 
It is a red giant star after all, but the best time to see this star depends on where you are on Earth. For instance, if you live in the Northern Hemisphere, your best bet is during the winter or between January and April. During this time, the star rises just as the sun is dipping into the horizon. While Betelgeuse is a fascinating star for many reasons, it is its impending fate that has attracted all the attention lately. Supernova Supernovas are some of the most spectacular events you can witness in the sky. The thing is, even though stars outlive us by billions of years, they do eventually die, but they don't go out quietly. Their passing is accompanied by the greatest of all shows known as supernovae. A supernova is what happens when a star has reached the end of its life and explodes in a brilliant burst of light. Supernovae can outshine entire galaxies, although briefly, and spill more energy than our Sun will do in its entire lifetime. According to NASA, supernovae are the largest explosions that take place in space. Even ancient astronomers without the benefits of modern-day space observation equipment knew about supernovae. The oldest mention of supernovas is RCW86, which Chinese astronomers saw in 185 AD. They claim the star stayed up in the sky for eight months. Apart from RCW86, Chinese and Korean astronomers spotted the explosion of the Crab Nebula in 1054, and historical evidence shows that the event might have been noticed by Native Americans in the US. The supernova was so bright that people saw it during the day. So how often does a supernova occur? That depends on the perspective, but the European Space Agency says one would occur once in 50 years in a galaxy as big as the Milky Way. This is equivalent to one supernova going off per 10 seconds in the entire universe. You won't see most of them, though, as they're so far away. There are two types of supernovae, Type 1 and Type 2. The former is how white dwarf stars give up the ghost, and this is more common in close binary star systems. As the gas of the companion star accumulates onto the white dwarf, the white dwarf is progressively compressed and sets off a runaway nuclear reaction inside that eventually causes a cataclysmic supernova outburst. Astronomers use Type 1 supernovae as standard candles to measure cosmic distances because all are thought to blaze with equal brightness at their peaks. However, Type 2 is the most exciting one. There are conditions that a star must meet before it can end up as a Type 2 supernova. A star must be several times more massive than the Sun to qualify. These stars will eventually run out of their supply of hydrogen and then helium fuel at their core. However, it will have enough mass and pressure to fuse carbon. Next, heavier elements gradually accumulate at the center and the star forms onion-like layers of material. The elements become lighter as we move toward the outside of the star. There is a certain mass level that triggers an explosion which scientists call the Chandrasekhar limit. For this reason, these Type II supernovae are also known as core collapse supernovae. Eventually, the explosion bounces back off the core, expelling the stellar material into space and forming the supernova. What's left is an ultra-dense object called a neutron star, a city-sized object that packs the mass of the Sun in a small space. Type II supernovas are further classified based on their light curves, which is basically a description of how the intensity of the light changes over time. For example, the light from Type II L supernovae declined steadily after the explosion, while the light of Type II P supernovae stays steady for a longer period before diminishing. Meanwhile, as stars become much more massive, they lose the ability to go supernova. When larger than the Sun is around 20 to 30 solar masses, they may not explode as a supernova but collapse to form scary black holes. What does a supernova look like? Studies have shown that before the spectacular explosion, supernova will vibrate like a huge speaker and emit an audible hum. The first time scientists caught a supernova while exploding was in 2008. The astronomers reported a strange, extremely bright burst of X-rays that lasted five minutes. However, further studies show that this supernova was rather unusual. This explosive fate is what awaits Betelgeuse. It all started when scientists noted that Betelgeuse was dimming. For over a century, astronomers have observed as Betelgeuse brightened and dimmed again and again. As a red supergiant star late in its life, Betelgeuse has expanded to an enormous size. Bubbles of material rose from inside the star to its surface and sank back down, changing the mix of hotter and cooler stuff on the star's surface. These changes made Betelgeuse appear brighter and fainter over time. 
For 25 years of that time, a trio of astronomers, including an amateur astronomer, had measured the brightness of Betelgeuse with a 10-inch diameter telescope. They noticed that Betelgeuse was getting fainter again. Some months later, they realized that Betelgeuse had gotten fainter than it had in the past 25 years and put out a post on a site known as the Astronomer's Telegram to alert other astronomers. Betelgeuse continued to get fainter until it became the faintest it's been in the last century. The change was remarkable. At its brightest, Betelgeuse is usually one of the six or seven brightest stars visible to humans in the night sky, but by this time it had dropped several places on that list to the 21st brightest. This unusual departure from a pattern made the scientific community start taking seriously the possibility of Betelgeuse going supernova on us. Based on its mass, astronomers estimate that the supergiant will go supernova when it's roughly 10 million years old. Meanwhile, Betelgeuse is probably about 10 million years old now. At that time, scientists did not fully understand what was happening to Betelgeuse, even though they suspected all was not well. However, what was not in doubt was that the star was geriatric or nearing the end of its stellar life. And thanks to the Hubble telescope, the researchers were eventually able to put together a clear picture of Betelgeuse's condition. What they discovered was massive. They found that a plume more than 1 million miles or 1.6 million kilometers across may have risen from inside the star. This is the equivalent of a star quake, or better still, a shock that blew out a chunk of the star's surface 400 million times larger than those usually seen in the sun's coronal mass ejection. In case you are wondering what coronal mass ejection is and why it's significant, a coronal mass ejection, or CME, is a vast cloud of electrically charged particles originating from the sun's upper atmosphere, or corona, when heated to enormous temperatures and launched with a huge burst of speed by the energy released in a solar flare. These hot blobs of plasma can have spectacular effects on planets that they encounter during their movement. However, you have nothing to fear as CMEs are not a direct threat to life on Earth but they can potentially damage the technologies on which we rely, so there is that. One of the things they can affect is the power grid. When CMEs arrive on Earth, they can cause geomagnetic storms that produce a ground-induced current that can damage our grid. They can also affect the accuracy of GPS, which forms the backbone of many of the services you rely on to get through the day. If you have heard of solar flares, CMEs have a similar origin. They are produced when a huge slice of the sun's magnetic field pushing out through the visible surface or photosphere squeezes together near its base and suddenly reconnects at a lower level. While this sounds like not a big deal, the process actually liberates an enormous amount of excess energy in the form of high-energy electromagnetic radiation. Naturally, that leads to the gases around the reconnection site getting heated up. We are talking about temperatures of 36 million degrees Fahrenheit or 20 million degrees Celsius and more. At this incredible temperature, the particles around the site, including those in the now isolated loop of the magnetic field above, get a massive boost of speed and energy, which produces a huge bubble of expanding hot gas that escapes from the effects of the sun's gravitational force. Once free, the hot gas races out across space. CMEs can reach blinding speeds of hundreds of miles per second. That is fast enough to propel them to the Earth in less than a day, although on average, they may require about 84 hours. With this background info about CMEs, you can understand why scientists were shocked to see Betelgeuse emitting so many materials. It was like the interior of Betelgeuse was sort of bouncing. But to the scientists, what Betelgeuse was doing was uncharted territory because they had never witnessed such a huge mass ejection of the surface of a star. It was like watching stellar evolution in real time. The research also incorporated information from a variety of other stellar observatories, such as the Stellar Robotic Observatory in Spain's Canary Islands and NASA's Earth-orbiting Stereo A spacecraft. By piecing together different types of data, scientists were able to put together a narrative of the blowout and what happened thereafter. One of the effects of the eruption was that a chunk of the star's lower atmosphere, the photosphere, was blown off, leaving behind a cool spot that was further occluded by the dust cloud from the blowout. The chunk blown off was several times the mass of Earth's moon. Scientists said this cool spot and dust cloud explain why Betelgeuse's light went dim. They also claim the star is still feeling the reverberations. Before the eruption, Betelgeuse showed a pulsating pattern, dimming and brightening on a 400-day cycle. That cycle was gone, at least temporarily. 
The materials moving from Betelgeuse's surface to its outer atmosphere reached 200,000 miles per hour. In the space of three months, Betelgeuse lost about twice as much materials to its surrounding space from its southern hemisphere as it normally does. However, the superhot plasma cooled significantly once it got millions of miles away from Betelgeuse. It condensed into dust grains and formed a cloud that blocked out the light. Scientists were able to establish using ultraviolet data when Betelgeuse's outer atmosphere returned to normal, even though they were still observing the dimming through visible wavelengths. And while everything seems to be back to normal in the outer atmosphere, the star's surface may still be jiggling like jello. So what will happen when Betelgeuse eventually goes supernova? While scientists cannot nail all the details by using sophisticated simulations, they have been able to provide a fairly accurate picture of what the last days of Betelgeuse will look like and what it means for the Earth. They obtained input for their model from the supernova 1987A. When the inevitable happens, Betelgeuse will shine as bright as the half-moon or about nine times as faint as the full moon. This will be observable for more than three months from the Earth. But before that time, scientists will be prepared for the event. They would have been tipped off by instruments on Earth detecting neutrinos or gravitational waves. They say all the brightness resulting from the explosion would be concentrated into one point. It will be so bright that you don't need to wait till night to see it as it will be visible during the day. For about a year, the bright spot will remain in the sky and, of course, it will be visible to all. And as the supernova dims, you'll be able to see it in the night for several years. With a star that is visible even during the day for so long a length of time, you can be sure it will generate lots of interest. Expect lots of YouTube videos on it and memes on social media. And with the advance warning that scientists expect Betelgeuse to give, you can bet a lot of people will be waiting for the explosion to start. And when the process is complete, skygazers will notice a difference. The Orion constellation will be missing its left shoulder and people will have to rely on other stars to find stars in the night sky. But will humans be affected? Will radiation from the explosion get to us? There is no need to worry about Betelgeuse's supernova. For a supernova to terribly affect us, it has to happen pretty close. That is, pretty close on the universal scale of measuring distances. That is about several dozen light years close to us. Thankfully, Betelgeuse is way more than that distant from us, some 700 or more light years away, so we can just sit back and enjoy the show. But that does not mean there is no impact on the Earth at all. For instance, Betelgeuse's supernova will affect animals, especially those that use the moon for navigation and easily get confused by artificial lights. When Betelgeuse shows up as another light object in the sky, it is going to be a confusing time for the poor animals. Astronomers, too, will be affected. Even though they are excited to witness a supernova as bright as Betelgeuse, it will disrupt their sky-watching schedule. When the moon is bright, they find it hard to see other celestial objects, so when Betelgeuse persists in the sky, there will not be enough darkness for them to work. And even studying Betelgeuse will be a challenge, as the brightness will overwhelm their instruments. Ground-based telescopes will need modifications to handle all that light. Most likely, they will be made to collect less light. When will this likely happen? Sadly, that may not be in the lifetime of anybody watching this video. Betelgeuse may still be at it 100,000 years from now. The massive star is still burning helium at its core, meaning there is still plenty of time. But of course, that will only give us time to get the popcorn ready, right? Let's hear what you think of Betelgeuse going supernova in the comments section below.